Did the Omicron variant evolve in an animal or a human being? A viewer's question that we'll be addressing this week. Welcome to the latest COVID-19 special. Also on the show, blood purification treatment in Germany. Why people from all around the world are seeking therapy for long COVID in Mülheim. But first to the US and a story involving baseball, healing horses and a teenager with long COVID who's been fighting his way back to health. Marie Sina reports. While other teenagers spend their mornings in school, Ami Korn goes to the stable. Since his life was turned upside down, he has forged a special bond with one of the horses. This is Mercedes and she was sick for a year, about a year with pneumonia, similar to me. Ami got sick with COVID last year. For seven months, he could barely get out of bed. Walking even a short block made his heart race and left him struggling for breath. One and a half years later, he still experiences debilitating memory problems and brain fog. So maybe I'll remember something the next day, but really like just remembering everything I did yesterday feels like I'm trying to remember something I did a month ago. In classes, um, I will be asking a question to the teacher and then I'll have completely, in the middle of my question, forgot what I was going to say, forgot the rest of the question. Long COVID refers to symptoms that linger at least a month after the initial COVID infection has passed. Doctors are still unclear as to why it happens and how to treat it, especially in young patients like Ami. We felt all along that the doctors were learning with us. And there were quite a few at the time, doctors that had kind of the standard line, this will go away, and that they're surprised that he's this affected because he's a kid. And so we were kind of in the dark. Ami is not an isolated case. New research shows long COVID can affect children in similar ways to adults. Horse therapy is helping Ami overcome anxieties around reclaiming his life. Just being around any of the horses, I feel calm. You know for sure when you're with an animal that like, there's a sense of they're just happy the way things are. With another person, you could think, what's going on? Are they going to say something rude? Are they, uh, do they like me? Do they not like me? Ami had to stay home for much of eighth grade. Now he's a ninth grader, but returning to his studies has been hard. His trouble focusing means he can only attend a small number of classes. Before he got COVID, Ami was a straight A student. Now he will likely have to repeat a year. My performance definitely went down. I wasn't like um, I wasn't getting as good grades, and things definitely feel harder than they did before. Without a known treatment for Ami's symptoms, his parents had to search for medical solutions on their own. You're trying to grasp. It was a lot of time, mostly late at night, when Ami was sleeping, uh, researching anywhere that was treating COVID for teenagers and or adults, um, searching for other people that had long COVID, trying to make connections, trying to find anything that could relieve his symptoms and turn things around for him. And at least physically, things have slowly been turning around. Ami finally has enough strength to get back to his passion, baseball. COVID had left his lungs and heart unable to cope with heavy exercise. Now, Ami thinks he can make a comeback. I'd love to play baseball professionally. And anyways, it's more, I mean, I love playing and I w worked really hard to get back to where I am and I'll continue and I'm gonna continue to work hard to make the most progress I can and really catch up on that year that I missed. I'm doing this. Physically. Ami is back on track. He and his parents hope the same will happen for his ability to focus so that their long fight with COVID can finally come to an end. Ah. Open. People with long COVID can end up desperate and willing to travel long distances in search of help. Some are coming to Germany for an as yet unproven treatment. Connor and Gabe from DW's Science Unscripted team went to investigate. 
So this building right here really doesn't look like much, but this is where people from all around the world are flying to, to get inside if they can, to try a new long COVID therapy or a relatively new one. The question is, what is that therapy? And can we say anything about whether it actually works? This is the office of Dr. Beate Yeager, who offers a blood clot therapy called help apheresis. When you go inside the waiting room, you can see people are really desperate and there are thousands more on the waiting list. Die Patienten kommen aus der ganzen Welt, also Kanada, USA, England, Skandinavien, Frankreich. Patients are coming from all over the world. Canada, the US, England, Scandinavia, France, Spain, Czechia, Russia, India, everywhere. Why are they coming here? Because they can get the help apheresis treatment here. The machines are here. It's a German invention. We've been doing this for 40 years. And when I saw the pathological reports back in March 2020 about vascular inflammation, I thought apheresis has to be able to help COVID patients as well. Und habe dann gedacht, das müsste COVID Patienten auch helfen. I'm on my way to meet a guy named James Cox, who flew all the way from Bermuda to get this therapy. James is part of the online long COVID community, and the story actually began with his tweet. So, uh, I am James. Uh, I'm 31 years old, and I've been suffering from long COVID for about 18 months now. Long COVID is quite frankly, completely uprooted and, and changed my life in every way possible. I struggle with a range of symptoms that undulate on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which have completely limited my life. I'm, I'm, I'm unable to work. I'm unable to exercise or participate in society in any normal way like I used to. I've been around the world to doctors in the US and the UK and even at home in Bermuda, and no one's really been able to provide me with any sort of clear cause or reason or treatment that may or may not help. Uh, and it seemed to me that the, the clinic here that I've been to actually offered me that. And in, in sort of desperation to try and find some relief from this agonizing journey that I've been on, uh, I came here. So does help apheresis actually treat some of the symptoms that people with long COVID are facing, like these clumpy platelets? The answer is we don't know yet. Working on that research now are Dr. Yeager herself, the Max Planck Institute for Physics, and a lung doctor named Asad Khan, who told us more from India. There are, I, I believe, many, many thousands, if not tens of thousands of people around the world who would love to see, you know, hard, peer-reviewed data on, on, on truly whether or not this works. Is it worth going to Germany or to other countries to do this? Can we expect that soon? Um, you can expect that. I can't say how soon, uh, but what I can tell you uh, is that looked at the effect of health apheresis on the blood appearance of patients, so looking at whether it had an impact on uh, the microclots, but also looking at measures of patient function, such as their cognition, their mobility, their ability to answer questionnaires about quality of life, and autonomic function. At this point, I can't say much more, apart from the fact that there have been some very interesting results. So I've spoken to maybe a dozen patients at this point who've had help apheresis treatment. Is it a miracle cure? It certainly is not. Uh, there are some patients who said, yes, it made them feel better. Others said it did nothing for me at all. And even, even Dr. Yeager herself has said that this is one piece of the puzzle. It is not the thing that's gonna fix long COVID for everyone. That said, there's potential, and we're waiting for the research to come in to show us exactly what help apheresis can do or can't do for people who are suffering from long COVID. If you have a question about COVID, Derek Williams, our science correspondent, has the answer. Write to covidproducer at dw.com for the latest research and facts. Today, he answers this question. Did the Omicron variant originate in animals or humans? When the Omicron variant hit seemingly out of 
nowhere at the end of last year. It, it took experts off guard in, in a number of ways. Uh, one of the biggest surprises was how very different the new variant was from earlier variants that had dominated the COVID landscape. Um, Omicron sported dozens of genetic mutations compared to the original virus, and, and genetic sequencing revealed that it hadn't really descended from its predecessor, Delta, which was what you would have expected, but instead seemed to have evolved somewhere, somehow in secret, possibly for more than a year before exploding onto the scene at the end of 2021. So where did all the viral evolution that led to Omicron take place? Uh, spoiler alert, we don't really know, but there are three hypothetical scenarios that experts take seriously. Um, two involve evolution in humans. The first postulates that Omicron evolved somewhere remote, where, where little surveillance was going on, in an area where authorities had no idea how many people were getting ill from the virus and, and didn't have the technology to track which variants were making who sick. That's certainly possible. Um, a second hypothesis postulates that Omicron's radical evolution might have happened within a single individual. So someone who was maybe seriously immunocompromised, who caught SARS-CoV-2, then had it for months because their immune system was unable to fight it off. And over that period, viruses inside their body reproduced generation after generation of a lineage that steadily accumulated more and more mutations until the Omicron variant arose. The third possibility, which could account for Omicron's surprise appearance, is that it didn't evolve in humans at all. Um, zoonotic viruses like SARS-CoV-2 jumped to us from animals in what we call spillover events. But we can also give them back to other species in what's termed spillback. Um, we know, for example, that mink and deer and a range of other animals can also get COVID-19. So if you imagine a scenario, say in 2020 sometime, where the coronavirus jumped from us to a population of animals in the wild, so spillback, then circulated in one or maybe even more wild species for months, mutating all the while, that could also explain Omicron's long list of, of novel mutations when it eventually jumped back to us in late 2021, or at least that's what the hypothesis says. It's still unclear whether mutations of the virus can develop in people who are immunocompromised. In recent months, the focus here has often turned to how COVID-19 affects people living with HIV. DW's Adrian Kriech reports from Botswana. Botswana in southern Africa. One in five adults here live with HIV. The epidemic is among the worst in the world. But Botswana also has one of Africa's leading HIV research institutions and some of the best virologists. Scientists here are currently wrapping up a major study with 1,500 participants, focusing on the intersection between HIV and COVID. It asks two core questions. Is COVID more dangerous for people living with HIV? And do the vaccines protect them too? And what was very striking for us is that we did not find any differences between people living with HIV and people living with HIV. And this is very, very important for us because um, it means that even if you're living with HIV, if you are virally suppressed, you can still produce enough immune responses against COVID. At the beginning of the pandemic, scientists assumed that people living with HIV would be at higher risk of getting seriously ill if they contracted COVID. Kasego Basha remembers that time very well. She is one of the few people in Botswana who are open about their HIV status. We were asking ourselves, 
for at the end of this COVID, are we all going to be gone as people living with HIV? I was afraid of it, but I ended up quitting it. I had it. Kasego Basha survived her COVID infection. In fact, she only had mild symptoms, possibly because she has been on antiretroviral drugs or ARVs for a long time. This is one of the key messages of Basha's NGO for young people infected with HIV. If patients take their daily ARVs, which are free in Botswana, the virus isn't much of a problem. And at the beginning of the pandemic, that message spread fast. When we heard about it, people, they took ARV serious because there was a rumor that those who are HIV positive are on medication. They are, they are immune, well, the immune system is strong. The research now confirms that what was initially just a rumor is in fact true. Individuals who are HIV infected have a suppressed uh, immune response uh, if they are not on treatment, that is. And of course, given the high prevalence of HIV in Botswana, there are bound to be a few or a good number of people who are immunocompromised. Uh, so that is something that uh, data, research data, has shown that those individuals are more likely to be impacted negatively by COVID or are more likely to progress uh, into hospitalization or severe disease uh, because of the HIV COVID co-infection. Researchers also highlight the risks of viruses and mutations evolving in a compromised immune host, which includes people who are not on treatment for their HIV infection. There have been cases, in, in one in Deben and one in Cape Town, uh, individuals who were not suppressed with HIV. They followed those individuals over time and they realized that those individuals, when we were infected with the beta variant, it developed a number of mutations. Uh, so it's an it's, it's, it's supposed the hypothesis that if you allow the virus to replicate in, in, a, in an environment of a compromised immune system, you are allowing the virus to create a lot of mutations. Botswana has made massive progress in the fight against HIV in recent years. The numbers of new infections are decreasing. More than 90% of those living with HIV know their status and less than 5% of women with HIV transmit the virus to their children. Activists and scientists in Botswana are now hoping that the massive scientific breakthroughs in COVID vaccines, especially those with mRNA technology, will have a spillover effect on the development of HIV vaccines. Kasego Basha doesn't want to give up hope that the HIV virus that killed many of her friends can one day be eradicated. We're all individuals. None of us will respond to an infection in exactly the same way. But after more than two years of pandemic, some people are clearly at higher risk of developing more serious symptoms. We spoke with Dr. Christian Karagianidis about a range of pre-existing medical conditions. Some people don't even notice that they've been infected with SARS-CoV-2. In others, the coronavirus causes severe symptoms that can lead to hospitalization and even death. A number of factors can increase the risk of severe COVID-19 symptoms, including age, sex and vaccination status. But there's also strong evidence that many pre-existing medical conditions or comorbidities can also put patients at greater risk. One in particular is obesity. Obesity is one of the well-established risk factors for COVID-19. Uh, we have to keep in mind that we have some differences between the US and Europe. So you have more patients with obesity in the US. So this uh, came up very early in the pandemic. In Europe, uh, we have some other risk factors, especially hypertension and diabetes, a little bit more than obesity, but still it's a high risk factor all over the world. The coronavirus enters the body through the airways and often stays in the upper respiratory tract, the sinuses, nose and throat. But if the virus manages to reach the lungs and flourish, it can cause life-threatening pneumonia or an immune reaction that spins out of control. This means that people with certain pre-existing lung diseases are at higher risk for developing severe COVID-19. Interestingly, the picture is much less clear-cut when it comes to a few respiratory conditions such as asthma. 
Many studies that have examined whether asthma is a risk factor have cautiously concluded that it isn't. But the data isn't clear-cut. So why is that? Up to now, if I look back now, two and a half years, we had only very, very few asthmatics or COPD patients on our ICU. One explanation might be that asthmatics as COPD patients, for example, prevented themselves by wearing masks and being very careful uh, in the public. And that might be one intervention which, which helped them very much uh, not to get these severe cases. Cardiovascular disease is another major risk factor. So if you've had a heart attack or have coronary artery disease, that's because the enzyme that acts as a doorway that allows the coronavirus to invade our cells occurs not just in the lungs, but at high levels in the heart and blood vessels. There, the virus can cause inflammation and blood clots. COVID-19 is not only a disease of the lung. COVID-19 is especially also a disease of the vessels. And that is something which uh, we always have to keep in mind. It might be that with the Omicron variant, this changed a little bit, but at least um, up to the Delta variant, we had many complications uh, in the vessels. And this is a strong link to, to heart and vessel diseases. People with diabetes, especially older patients, are also at higher risk and so are those who are moderately or severely immunocompromised. The most prominent uh, patient population we have at the moment are patients with transplantation and immunosuppression, or those ones with rheumatic diseases who uh, receive special drugs who really suppress the immune system very severely. Chemotherapy drugs also increase risk, so cancer patients receiving chemotherapy or who have received chemotherapy in the last three months are at higher risk of developing severe disease. Some other health conditions also put people at higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19, but these comorbidities are among the most common. When the COVID vaccination drive got underway in the global north last year, many African countries started to realize the urgent need to develop local vaccine production capacities. It's since become a top priority, as Julius Mugambwa reports from Uganda. Here at the Uganda Virus Research Institute, scientists are developing a COVID-19 vaccine. Clinical immunologist Pontiano Kalibu heads the team and explains what drives him. I think it was awakening. We knew that there was inequity. Uh, we didn't, Africa is behind in terms of uh, really uh, innovation and discovery and manufacture. But uh, for COVID, it really showed us that we need to do something better, more, more. Over the years, Kalibu has published numerous articles on immunology and virology. He and his team now have a government grant to concentrate their research on COVID-19. We've been advocating, why can't we participate in vaccine design? Not only in human, but our colleagues in animal. Uh, they have been trying, but the funding has been limited. In Africa, very few countries uh, that have been uh, developing vaccines. When the first batch of vaccines arrived in Uganda, President Museveni was one of the first to get a jab. He also granted researchers $40 million to develop their own vaccine. We are working on the NAVCOV-19 vaccine, and specifically here, we use a weaker or milder version of the virus, of another virus, to help us carry the component of the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the body. So specifically, we have um, isolated adenoviruses from our local chimpanzees here. We have transformed their nature to allow us to insert the spike gene of the COVID-19 viruses that were prevalent here in Uganda. Chimps share 98% of their DNA with humans, making them our closest living relatives. Chimpanzee adenoviral vectors are a well-studied vaccine type. And we want to use chimpanzee viruses as vectors, just as our colleagues in Oxford have done. So this is just a vehicle it carries a part of the uh, coronavirus so that when your body sees it injected into you as a vaccine, 
It behaves as if it has seen a virus. It produces, the body produces antibodies and T cells, and you have some immunity. So that's the approach we're using. Over the next few months, the vaccine candidates will be tested on mice. I'm optimistic, but as a scientist, I have to be cautious. But uh, we've done everything right, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and I hope that out of the three vaccine candidates, at least one will give us the right immune response. And if the team is successful, they'll have made a valuable contribution to boosting Africa's capacity to respond to any future pandemics. That's all for this week. Stay healthy and see you next time.